So tonight, the schedule will be, after I shut up, I'll introduce Michael Gosney. He'll give about an hour-long presentation, uh, including some Q&A. And then at around 9 o'clock, or a couple minutes after, we will break, but only for 15 minutes. So those, those of you who, who need to get going home at that time can do so. And, you know, but then after that, at about quarter after 9, we're going to reconvene for like a big circle roundtable discussion about all these topics related to our colleges, other solutions to climate change, and how our colleges really play a key role. Because as you'll see, it's a multifaceted topic. Um, I also wanted to mention, so please prepare to stick around if you'd like to. Everyone's welcome to stay for the roundtable conversation. Um, we're recording the presentation and the after presentation discussion. So if you want to participate in that, and you don't want to be on camera, we'll have a special section for people who don't want to be on camera. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, other housekeeping items. Wanted to mention that at the table in the back there, uh, Michael Gosney has kindly provided a bunch of books and resources pertaining to our colleges. So feel free to have a look there. <clears throat> and also Joanne Drabeck, if you'll raise your hand. Joanne also has cal Sierra Club calendars for sale uh, at a discount. So. See Joanne about calendars. Um, I want to mention, um, let me take a deep breath. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and actually, on that note, I want to mention that uh, I need help. We need help. The Sierra Club dinners are a wonderful, wonderful venue, as you all know. My dad was program chair going back to the 70s. Jane was program chair for a number of years. Jane and Morton and Anna have helped out tremendously, but we, we need help, we as a group. Joanne as well, too, too many to mention, but we kind of distribute the load of all this amongst all of us. Many hands make heavy work light. So if you're interested in volunteering, please check that on the sign-up sheet that Melissa has circulated and will continue to circulate. So please sign up, number one, mainly just so we can contact you. Forget about being a volunteer. If you want to volunteer, that's optional. So, but please sign up regardless. And yeah, so Melissa's got the sheet, but there'll be time after the presentation as well. So, but, but please sign up on the sheet before you leave. Um, I wanna mention upcoming dinners on February 28th. We'll have a presentation on the Philippines, land of my grand, grandmother's birth, my father's mother, uh, Don Lowry and uh, Jackie Minard took an amazing trip there, amazing photography, so that's on February 28th. And then on March 28th, uh, Susan and Ralph Acorn uh, will do a, pre a beautiful presentation on Camino de Santiago in northern Spain. And they're going to cover uh, two of the less traveled but older routes. There's a number, of, there isn't just one Camino, there's multiple paths on the Camino de Santiago. So they're going to be covering um, two of the less traveled, more northern routes, the Norte and Primitivo. Um, the April dinner is still TBD, and then uh, on May 23rd, what we're going to have visiting professor uh, Lucia Garces Loman from Brazil, who's a, a conservation biologist from Brazil, she'll be doing a, a beautiful presentation on the Amazon the flora and fauna of the Amazon, <coughs> and uh, some of the, a lot of the science, history, and art, uh, covering the lost art of scientific artwork. Now, in the after presentation discussion, we're going to go deeper into kind of the broader context within which Michael Gosney's uh, work uh, exists, which is the uh, a term Michael taught me, which is solutionaries. Now, I want to acknowledge there's a lot, most of you, many of you in this room are solutionaries and who work on different facets of our world problems and, and different solutions to them. So we're going to be uh, covering a number of those. For, ex uh, for example, my partner Melissa is one of a group of leaders in the Pacific Northwest where we live working on uh, saving the whales who are at risk of extinction as part of our planetary crisis. Um, we'll talk about uh, 
different strategies for cooling the planet, <clears throat> for ending hunger, um, and kind of meta-solution of collective intelligence as a platform, a, a planetary community, forming a collective intelligence so that together we can co-create uh, solutions. That's actually an integral part of our ecology, so everything overlaps. So I really, and so, and at, at the after dinner, after presentation discussion, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to go around the circle and you can talk about what areas or what projects or initiatives you've been working on. So everyone will have an opportunity there. So I really encourage everyone to stick around uh, after the intermission for, um, for the uh, discussion. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce by way of, just give me one more minute so I can properly introduce Michael, who has been a colleague of mine for the last couple of years. We've worked together on a number of holistic solutions, including our colleges, including collective intelligence, um, and a number of different projects. So um, the, the origin of Michael's work in our colleges goes way back to probably the 80s, early 90s for sure. Michael worked with um, world famous uh, arcology uh, pioneer Paolo Soleri, uh, who pioneered Arcosanti. Michael was on the board of both Arcosanti and uh, Biosphere 2, and has also been a co producer with Paolo Soleri of the Paradox Conferences uh, in the late 90s on arcologies. Um, and uh, Michael really thinks broadly and deeply and has collaborated with numerous different intentional communities around the world, uh, of which our colleges are, are an example, a very special uh, case of those, which are designed to get to the roots of many of the world's problems. Um, and uh, it's just a whole new paradigm. So uh, Michael will talk about kind of both the gradual evolution of our colleges going from cities in their current state, however dysfunctional, evolving, kind of like a transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. So that sort of gradual evolution from current cities in situ all the way to blank slate uh, design and creation of whole new arcologies from, you know, farmland, for example. So anyway, again, Please stick around for the afternoon discussion, and please give a warm welcome to my buddy, Michael Gosney. All right. You want to speak well, right in there? Even okay. hold, hold it. For... Yeah, maybe. Wonderful to see uh, so many great people here tonight, and a uh, really nice, uh, diverse mix of uh, environmentally conscious, conscious beings. Um, really want to thank uh, Jamin and the Sierra Club for this opportunity. And uh, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Jamin's uh, role in, in inspiring me to really, for me, it's, it's a little bit of a revisiting of these subjects. Um, uh, but as I will share with you, I've been uh, kind of on this trail for many years. Um, I, I will say that um, I'm, uh, I'm not a practicing professional or true expert in uh, you know, sustainable urban design, but I've been interested in this really for most of my life um, uh, since I uh, went out to Arizona State and first encountered uh, Palo Solari's work. Um, so uh, just to say kind of who I am, uh, why I'm standing up here talking about this subject, um, my affiliations, I, I am involved with a, we have a nonprofit that uh, is under the Buckminster Fuller Institute, and uh, our focus is on online platforms for collaboration and, uh, and community. And I also, uh, I was not uh, uh, on the board of Biosphere 2, however, I work very closely with the crew that developed Biosphere 2, John Allen and uh, his wife, Deborah Perry Snyder, who is the publisher of Synergetic Press. And uh, we publish books on biospheric science and consciousness. So I'm, I'm currently very engaged uh, with a publishing house based out in Santa Fe. 
I also was uh, on the board of the Kosati Foundation through the 90s. Um, I originally uh, connected with, with Paolo and company, uh, working on one of the early book projects with them. In fact, it's one of the small little books uh, in the back called Arcosani, an Urban Laboratory. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I also, uh, in the early 2000s, and this is uh, where this Calafia concept uh, came together, um, uh, I formed uh, with my colleagues uh, Mark Kasky, who's here tonight, and I'll ask Mark to say a few words later, uh, and Henry Dakin, uh, a wonderful gentleman here in San Francisco, a philanthropist who supported many uh, progressive ventures. We formed the Green Century Institute as a clearinghouse for sustainable communities, and so we had a focus on that uh, uh, for about five years and convened many salons, uh, and um, uh, we did uh, gather a group uh, researching this proposal for a Northern California model arcology, and we called it Calafia. So I'm going to start with kind of the big picture and the inspiration of our arcology. Um, uh, this is the book that uh, was published by MIT Press in uh, 1971, and it was in many ways a shot heard around the world. Uh, it uh, includes uh, uh, about 30 different arcology concepts, uh, ranging from smaller sized uh, projects uh, housing uh, 10,000 people up to uh, huge uh, conceptions uh, of these ecologically designed cities for even as many as half a million. And um, the book uh, uh, also has a, a great deal of information uh, on Soleri's uh, philosophy and the methodology that he proposes called Arcology, Architecture Ecology. Um, it inspired uh, architects, needless to say, around the world and urban designers, but also, as I discovered over the years, Soleri's work has inspired uh, creative people in all professions. Uh, really been amazing, uh, the influence that he's had. On the other hand, his work has remained relatively unrecognized by the broader culture um, because in part, uh, like so many uh, visionary efforts, um, our mainstream culture tends to marginalize anything it can't uh, uh, absorb. So, arcology is simply put the integration of architecture and ecology. And these, these three points here are, are the way uh, the Kosani Foundation defines it. It's a methodology to shape urban landscapes that are dense, integrated, walkable, and three-dimensional. And it's very much about a means, a way that we can support the complex activities of our culture and fulfill the human spirit while keeping our, uh, our civilization, our infrastructure in harmony with the natural world. So the key concepts of our ecology um, there's a lot to it, but these, these are three kind of critical areas. The concept of the urban effect, which as Soleri observes, occurs all through nature. When organisms gather, and there's usually some form of a container that's facilitating their gathering, that's where synergy occurs, that's where evolution occurs. And uh, Soleri also um, really kind of anticipated the whole complexity theory paradigm, recognizing that complex systems evolve through increasingly miniaturized uh, systems of form uh, and, and through, through over time. So more complex systems, more miniaturized and compact. And finally, the city uh, being recognized throughout human history uh, as a container for human evolution. And in Soleri's view, he sees an integration with natural principles uh, for our uh, huge requirement for human habitat to be an opportunity to uh, take the container to the next, the next level, um, encouraging a, a, positive, a more positive human evolution. So a little bit about Soleri, he's Italian, he was born in Turin, Italy, did some architectural projects over there, but he came out to Taliesin West, studied with Frank Lloyd Wright, got kicked out of Taliesin West and formed his own compound in Scottsdale, 
called the Kosani Foundation, where he did some of his early uh, design work, uh, prototyping uh, different kinds of architectural forms and creating a showcase for his work. Uh, he then uh, got together uh, with his wife, Kali, and uh, raised money through their family connections and purchased the land 60 miles north of Phoenix where uh, Arcosani, as a, a prototype arcology, was begun. That was in uh, uh, around 1970. So Soleri's primary influences, other than Frank Lloyd Wright and his green architectural sensibility, was also very much the vision of Tehar de Chardin, the Jesuit priest who was also a paleontologist, who many of you may have, have read uh, his work, his advanced concepts of human evolution. Um, and so, um, and by the way, you know, Soleri considers his philosophical work to be as valuable as his design work. Um, he always eschewed the academic uh, direction for his work, and in some ways that's why his, his legacy maybe isn't as strong as it could be in the philosophy circle, but uh, I believe that he, in his writings, uh, there's still a lot for him to contribute. For one thing, it's very evident when you look at right now his body of work that he definitely anticipated biomimicry, complexity theory, conscious evolution, and even in the 90s when we were working together on the Paradox Conferences, the potential of cyberspace. One thing that he predicted when in the, in the uh, late 90s we were first seeing the emergence of e-commerce and Amazon and so forth, he was concerned that the already uh, harmful paradigm of single family homes and a car driven society um, with the idea of shipping goods to your home was gonna create what he called a global hermitage of isolated humans out of touch with each other. So Arco Santi, was founded in 1970, the concept being a model arcology for 3,000 plus residents. They have about 3,000 acres on which the actual arcology complex uh, would take only about 10 acres, 10 or 20 acres. Uh, currently, it, it serves as a Solari archive and has an ongoing function as what Solari like to call an urban laboratory. Uh, they hold six week workshops every year. They've had 8,000 participants over a couple of decades uh, from all over the world. And it's a, a very uh, well-visited Arizona tourist site. They give tours every day. They get 40,000 a year through there. It also serves as an event venue. Um, they have concerts on a regular basis, the local community coming up from Phoenix. Uh, the Forum Festival is a, a larger uh, electronic music festival that's been going on for the last five years there. and. Uh, this past year, uh, we, they had uh, the group at Arcosani had the second Convergence Festival, uh, which I was delighted to, uh, to join um, back in uh, October. And uh, it was a delight for me being out at Arcosani. I hadn't been there in a while. And uh, uh, the Convergence Festival was very much uh, reminiscent of um, the Paradox Conferences we did in the, the late 90s and 2001. Permanent population at Arcosani is uh, relatively small, but um, uh, the community associated with the project uh, around the world is actually quite substantial. Let's see here. So those buildings that uh, the previous slide showed, um, uh, they like to call Old Town, assuming that the rest of the project is built. And you can see in these models, uh, the smaller structures um, are, the, are the existing structures, and these are different uh, versions of a completed Arcosani. Those are stepped greenhouse gardens, an apron of gardens there. You see the use of the, uh, what are called apps, the quarter sphere structures that when positioned uh, pr properly uh, in the summer, uh, sh uh, it casts shade. In the winter, the light 
goes into the quarter sphere and uh, and heats. As an example of the um, archaeological design features, there's many just passive design features that uh, are quite significant. So, Arcosani is uh, aspires to be uh, a full arcology model. Um, it's considered. Um, 500 residents is considered a critical mass to have just a small uh, functioning ar arcology, and that's been the, the goal of Arcosani to ramp it up to at least 500 residents. <clears throat> but as it's been over the years, Arcosani is part of what's, you know, uh, more of a, the eco village uh, movement, which I will uh, uh, review because the, the whole history uh, and current activities of the eco-village movement is very relative to the kind of new paradigm, larger eco-cities uh, that we need to see happening. And so, arcology remains an unrealized uh, methodology, but in the meantime, uh, Soleri's work was directly responsible for inspiring what's known as the, the, the eco-city uh, movement around the world. And so the eco-city designation is uh, much broader uh, in application of what, what that means, what the definition of an eco-city is, uh, versus the, the much more uh, strictly defined uh, methodology of arcology. Um, uh, simply put, an eco-city is an ecologically healthy city. Um, Richard Register uh, was um, associated with and uh, interested in Soleri's work, uh, and I met him many years ago uh, in the uh, late 70s, and uh, he went on to form Eco City Builders in Berkeley, which has done a lot of work with just um, local projects, greening cities in different ways. But they also launched many years ago the Eco City World Summit, which is held in different cities around the world. And um, the the upcoming event is going to be in Vancouver this year in October. And uh, by the way, this presentation gets to be kind of information intense in some places. There's lots of URLs. I encourage you to, to jot them down. But also later when we have the talk, I can call some of these screens back up. So this slide goes through, you know, some of the various applications of eco-city uh, design. And uh, the sustainable urbanism movement uh, is, is become really more of a mainstream trend. Um, most of the serious activities going on in Asia. <clears throat> but these are not wholly new cities for the most part. They're, it's infill development in existing cities. And this is perhaps the most important thing that we do is that we, you know, as the next line indicates, we, we integrate regenerative systems by adding to and retrofitting existing infrastructures. But all of that kind of activity can learn from, you know, the ideal of a fully regenerative arcology um, uh, project. That's why, uh, you know, the mission to design radical models is so important because they, they it, such efforts pull other initiatives along. So we have, you know, uh, the LEED certification, which you may have heard of, which is, have been defining the U.S. Green Building Council, defining uh, green buildings has been gradually, over the past several years, establishing lead for cities. And uh, Savona, Italy is the first lead certified city over in Europe. Um, the GBCI is the uh, group that does the certification, and they do certification for a number of different uh, green standards, not just lead. All right, so eco-city builders, suburban urbanism lead for cities. And finally, I was just mentioning the transition town movement, which has been kind of an organic movement around the world. Um, but there's a UK nonprofit called the Transition Network that has started to uh, connect the different uh, transition town groups around the world. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of activity in Asia, and these are large, well-planned, um, infill developments that incorporate, you know, a lot of great new design ideas and technologies. 
And uh, this is an example of a huge outfit based in Singapore, Kepcorp, uh, one of their projects. All of these websites that I cite in here are, are full of inspiring examples. Uh, what's really encouraging is over the past 10 years, there's been a lot of wonderful developments in uh, kind of what you might call eco-technology, uh, kind of technologies that can be incorporated into uh, large-scale uh, new cities. And uh, one of the great examples of that is the work of Michael Pollan uh, with his exploration architecture firm. Uh, these are some energy solutions that are meant to be part of a integrated uh, city design. This is another example of their work, a biomimetic office building. Again, I'm sorry about the slides. These are the, the energy. This is the biomimetic office building. They're beautiful slides, Michael. Well, yeah, I just need to remember to click the clicker. <laughs> Do it for you? No, no, no. I'm good. So, and then there's some, you know, a lot of big ideas, and I just hate to say this, but big ideas being floated. <laughs> the Seasteading Institute, which is uh, in part uh, based uh, right here in Berkeley, uh, has been developing um, plans. Uh, for a floating city, and they actually have this underway in, in French Polynesia, really worth checking out. Very, very exciting work they're doing. And um, on the right is uh, uh, Vincent Calabot uh, Architecture. They're uh, in Paris, and uh, I'll tell you what, their website is just full of incredible, exciting concepts. These are the, this is the next generation of Solaris, you know? We, we have them, things are going on. <clears throat> So, so the, you know, the eco-city movement, as I just expressed, is a diverse, uh, wide-ranging movement toward greening communities, whether they be large cities or, or smaller towns. Uh, and that's very exciting, and it's very important that that movement continue and expand. But when we look at um, the, the ideas that need to come together for dramatic model projects such as the Calafia notion. Uh, we have a lot to learn from the eco-village movement, which is really a, more associated with what you would call the intentional community movement. Um, and uh, the definition, I'll go ahead and read this, uh, as it's described on the Global Eco Village Network site. An eco village is an intentional, traditional, or urban community that is consciously designed through locally owned participatory processes in all four dimensions of sustainability social, culture, ecology, and economy to regenerate social and natural environments. And the eco village movement incorporates a number of different uh, movements within it, as listed here, permaculture, the transition town movement, the placemaking movement, conscious festivals, regenerative agriculture, community currency, conscious capitalism, holistic health, sustainability applied to communities, and environmental activism. So here's some resources. The Global Eco Village Network is uh, divided into uh, regional groups uh, worldwide. There's several thousand members. Next Jenna is the younger generation uh, arm of the Global, e Global Eco Village Network and very active here in the US. Uh, are those all eco villages that exist right now? Say again? Are those all eco villages that exist right now? Yes, those are, uh, th that's the map off of uh, the Global Eco Village Network. And and those indicate four eco villages there, 134 there, etc. And so, there's another um, wonderful resource. In fact, uh, in some ways, um, 
more broadly applicable uh, to uh, mainstream society is the work of the, the Fellowship for Intentional Community. They're based actually back in Missouri, in rural New Missouri, but they're influential all, all over the world and they publish the Communities Magazine. A couple of copies of that are out on the table uh, in back. And so the eco-village movement is very diverse. There's, you know, thousands of projects around the world, but most of those are, 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 are much more modest, privately owned efforts uh, for 10 to 50 people. But there has emerged over the years uh, a number of iconic model communities. Uh, one of the most um, visible is Oroville in Pondicherry, southern India. Um, this uh, uh, project was um, begun through the inspiration of the great Indian sage Aurobindo uh, <clears throat> and his partner uh, known as the mother who was a, a French woman who joined him later in his life and uh, really was a, a remarkable figure. Um, they are um, they were in uh, Pondicherry there in southern India and uh, uh, Oroville um, was developed after Aurobindo's death, but the mother was really the, the champion and made it happen, and around Oroville, she's kind of considered the, the patron saint, so to speak. Um, they did a tremendous uh, restoration job, um, really uh, taking uh, some land that was completely uh, depleted and did uh, remarkable uh, restoration, planting um, two million trees and, and um, improving the watershed and making it a virtual paradise. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, the house there on the lower right is an example of uh, any number of beautiful architectural designs uh, that are, have been employed in the, the residences there. Um, I re really recommend uh, all these examples I'm showing that you, you check out their websites and, and see uh, what all they have going on. Uh, next is uh, Dom and Her. Um, <clears throat> this is a project built in northern Italy. Now, both of these projects have a, you know, kind of a spiritual community basis, and that's been kind of common in the intentional community world because it's a, uh, very often the case uh, that a spiritual community wants to have a new kind of community experience. And uh, <clears throat> so Dom and Her uh, in northern Italy is, in fact, a modern mystery school and they uh, began with uh, very advanced healing practices um, and um, also have some very advanced uh, sustainable development components. And like um, a lot of these projects, they, they all have different emphases, and, but there's many different solutions um, that have emerged. Uh, and um, uh, an example from Dom and Her would be their nucleos. Um, they have uh, <clears throat> about uh, 200 people living in a, the central compound, but the rest of the 800-person community live in nucleos, which are residential houses that have been purchased uh, in the uh, neighboring town uh, outside of Turin. Uh, they're, they're, they're north of Turin, but um, there's some smaller towns around there that have actually had depressed real estate values. So. They bought these houses and their own crews went in and retrofitted them uh, so that they could house 15 to 20 people, adding bedrooms and larger kitchens and so forth. And the nucleos all have kind of a balance of uh, age groups and uh, <clears throat> some of them have businesses uh, within them and they all uh, share resources uh, together. And um, so uh, the nucleo concept I think is really brilliant and, and it's been kind of cool to see over the past 10 years the emergence of uh, kind of a similar concept that we see going on in the Bay Area and in other cities uh, where people are um, sharing resources uh, in a network of, of rented homes. Um, they've also for many years had a community, current, community currency uh, at Dom and Her that's uh, been, been very uh, effective. Um, they've had a lot of you know healing and massage and other kinds of practices, agriculture and so they exchange goods and services within the community using their own currency. And that's a very, the whole concept of a community currency coupled with the evolving 
uh, blockchain cryptocurrency opportunities uh, has a lot, I think, to play uh, as we go forward with these kinds of communities. Um, Tamara's over in Portugal. Uh, and by the way, uh, there's ties to San Francisco from all of these. Um, Oralville uh, shares uh, its, its origin with the California Institute of Integral Studies here in San Francisco. There's a deep connection between the two. And uh, Adam and her, uh, the folks from Dom and her have been in San Francisco quite a bit, uh, giving workshops and things. Um, and likewise, Tamara, Ben Mendelson, and others have been here doing workshops. And so there's a lot of, you know, because San Francisco is San Francisco, it's a very advanced place for evolutionary initiatives. And so it's not surprising that these projects around the world reach out to us and, and vice versa. But uh, they are uh, developing new social models, uh, and, uh, but they're also very uh, uh, focused on the bioregional uh, stewardship. They call it the biotope, the, the more local part of the bioregion. And um, they've done a lot of great, uh, great research there and, and uh, a lot of outreach and a lot of ed education. You know, Findhorn uh, is another uh, community. I don't have them here, but I should mention Findhorn, a uh, very strong force behind the Global Eco Village Network in Scotland, and uh, the Gaia Education Extension of Findhorn is uh, doing uh, a lot uh, to uh, spread this knowledge and bring people together around the world. So, uh, so. Regen Villages is an example of uh, uh, some of the newer efforts that are going on. And unfortunately, James Ehrlich, who uh, heads up this initiative, uh, he's in Stanford. He couldn't join us here tonight. Um, but they are developing a project in the Netherlands. And uh, it's really meant to be very much a pilot, a model. Uh, but they have a whole system in place uh, to create a replicable model, replicable model, and um, uh, a lot of IT uh, infrastructure. It's taking the smart city concept to a whole new level. Um, they call it the, the Village OS, and uh, uh, their website is uh, quite informative. I would encourage you to check out regenvillages.com, uh, and they're they're looking at projects. Uh, in Europe and Asia, <clears throat> as well as the U.S., um, but the Netherlands project is actually uh, pretty far along. So, I wanted to just kind of give that overview of where things are at with arcology, eco cities, and the very lively movement of eco villages worldwide. But. Uh, now let's talk about this, this notion of, of, of Calafia. And um, I'm going to start with a little, little history of the concept. Um, but certainly uh, the name, uh, many of you may know that Calafia is the namesake of the Californias. Uh, and it's uh, named after a mythical Amazon goddess. And that's a uh, mural in the Mark, Hop Mark Hopkins Hotel. So I'm going to go through a quick, a little history of this idea, and it's it's partly kind of my history too. Um, I was in San Diego for many years, and uh, I, uh, uh, after having been out at Arizona State, when I first encountered Solari, and uh, you know, I learned about Solari in, in a general, inter a wonderful introduction to architecture class that began with the pyramids and it ended with arcology. And so I was like, okay, arcology is the way the world is going. I thought naively at the time, uh, <laughs> but it, it, it did get me uh, uh, quite inspired. And um, uh, so I, I, <clears throat> I did visit Arcosani quite a number of times uh, after um, uh, attending the university there in 73. 
uh, and I got involved um, uh, in the 80s uh, with the organization by publishing the, the book that I mentioned earlier, uh, Arcosani, an urban laboratory. But uh, to be honest, I had forgotten about this uh, until I, I started thinking about uh, this presentation. <clears throat> but uh, it really began uh, back in the uh, uh, early 90s when I did have Paolo Soleri out to speak at an event in San Diego to the American Institute of Architects and also had uh, the director of uh, the environmental laboratories uh, that was designing a lot of the Biosphere 2 project. And, um, and that event brought me in contact with a number of smart city enthusiasts in San Diego. Uh, and back then there was a lot of aspiration for San Diego to be a model smart city. And in fact, it is today. Uh, San Diego is one of the leading uh, technologically sophisticated uh, smart cities uh, in the world, but I proposed back then a model eco-city project um, to be built on the border of uh, the U.S. and uh, Mexico, a San Diego-Tijuana um, collaboration. And people were very excited about that, and uh, it didn't get super far, but there was a few meetings and um, a lot of exciting exchange about that. And that's, that's really where the seed idea came. But um, when we produced the Paradox Conferences at Arcosani in 97, 99, and 2001, uh, <clears throat> I was bringing uh, leaders from the technology world out there. I have been for many years producing the digital be-in here in San Francisco. And uh, uh, so the whole concept of the Paradox Conferences was to get the technology sector and the early sustainability leaders together, and they were wonderful uh, events out there. And in part, they satisfied my urge to bring my friends out to Arcosani and have a great party after having gone out there for so many years thinking, this place is fabulous, I want to share this with my friends. Well, we had wonderful events, and, uh, but what I noticed was so many of the attendees, um, speakers, and so much energy was coming from the Bay Area. Um, and uh, I decided that it was important for us to kind of focus this subject uh, in the Bay Area. And um, so, as I mentioned earlier, Mark Kasky and Henry Dakin and I formed the Green Century Institute and uh, did a number of events. <clears throat> we uh, produced the World Environment Day, which was held in San Francisco. That's held in different cities around the world, um, but in 2005. We did a Green Cities exhibit and uh, got a group of people together, some, uh, a number of uh, really enthusiastic, smart folks uh, working on this. And it kind of led up to a symposium that we had at CIIS in 2006, where we you know, boiled down the ideas. And uh, <clears throat> so, and I kind of echoed uh, these themes and this idea uh, in the digital be-in events in 06, 07, and 08 that were themed Planet Code, Biomimicry, and EcoCity. And we had Paolo Soleri in town for the EcoCity World Summit, which happened to be in San Francisco that year as well. Uh, and that was a great opportunity to expose these ideas to our technology community. So the upshot at that time, back in 2006, This was our vision for Calafia. A world-class real estate development and model eco-city with a variety of residential housing configurations and a full complement of civic, retail, and commercial spaces. Leading edge green architectural design, advanced energy and information systems, new generation of social frameworks and civic organizations to encourage the healthy and ecologically sustainable lifestyle. Importantly, draw upon the unique high-yield resources of the San Francisco region with its evolutionary technology and environmental and social innovations. Involve many of the world's top sustainable design researchers, entrepreneurs, and institutions. And in sum, to bring the fruits of California's amazing, diverse, world-changing culture into a high-visibility, concrete living model for a new urban lifestyle. Beautiful. So that's where we were 10 years ago and, and, you know, 
had a wonderful circle of, uh, of people involved, many experts uh, weighing in. So just to talk for a second about what are our incentives to do these kinds of things? Well, there is an exploding urban population. It's, it's, it's already over half the world's population. It's gonna be, you know, almost 70% by 2050. And uh, the huge, huge uh, increase in Asia and Africa. <clears throat> so, you know, there's going to be a lot of brand new cities built. And uh, we need to be thinking about how those are designed. And this is a principle that I've definitely put out for years, and that is the, the reality of cities as the true network of, uh, of our civilization versus the nation states, which I think we all see are, are kind of uh, becoming obsolete in many ways. Uh, and uh, perhaps even the more difficult thing is the, the corporate constructs of global capitalism. Um, we need to empower this network of cities, empower urban centers, um, not only to do the, the redesign that's necessary, but to give them more sovereignty, regional sovereignty. Uh, if local communities can control what happens within their region, uh, we could rein in the, the corporate uh, intrusion. Um, <clears throat> but last but not least, as far as our incentives, um, we all know that uh, we're in serious trouble as a global civilization. Um, we know the seas are going to rise. And how will we uh, house those displaced millions? We're going to have to build new cities. That heal the planet. That heal the planet. So what are the challenges? Well, the zoning and building codes and entrenched bureaucracies about the standard businesses as usual development, that's a barrier. Investment parameters dictated by traditional residential and commercial development interests and established financial models, they don't work for these kinds of new concepts. We also have our consumer culture that marginalizes innovation and alternative approaches to com community planning. And we're all conditioned, you know. It's harder to change our, our lifestyle choices. Uh, and, and that's very much what this is all about. It's not just uh, the design and tech solutions, it's, it's, it's social. So a few considerations about Calafia. Certainly we're looking at a new kind of multi-stakeholder development, not the standard model. The kind of thing that we'd like to see happen here in California would require some very deep cooperation with the state and county and whatever local and local cities and townships are involved. Uh, a new kind of diverse development consortium. The opportunity to incorporate an online platform from the get-go for the develop, development groups that are involved and early community participation, bringing in the resources, experts, social systems, investment. Having, of course, uh, an expert advisory board, new kinds of financial instruments. That's one of the, the big challenges is how you balance hard capital and social capital. But there's some wonderful opportunities with, as I mentioned earlier, the cryptocurrency uh, and co-op models and so forth. Uh, media programming be a, being an important part of it because it would be very much uh, an educational, have an educational component. Um, and uh, of course, uh, collaboration with resident projects around the world, organizations and, and NGOs. So, um, in exploring the potential scenarios for developing a project like this, we are talking about not an eco-village for 200 or even 2,000 people. We're talking about ultimately a, a, a large town for 10,000. And, uh, but it does make sense uh, to consider the first phase of development to be on the eco-village level, a proto-community that would, uh, would be the 
uh, the, the groups uh, <coughs> uh, that are involved in the development of the project, uh, some core community housing, and some early commercial enterprises. Uh, we had a lot of opportunities out at Arcosani to use it as a test site uh, for new technologies. Uh, and those opportunities were mostly uh, not realized because Palo was so anti-commercial. <laughs> but um, uh, I think that's a really uh, vital aspect of this project. Uh, there also could be some early agriculture uh, and educational uh, partnerships uh, in the early uh, stages of uh, uh, getting the community off the ground. But uh, with the uh, <coughs> The actual uh, development of the larger project, uh, it might have phases such as this, uh, more residential, uh, an initial uh, group of commercial spaces, uh, perhaps bringing in some ecological research kinds of organizations, university connections, a health complex, gardens, greenhouses, and farms. The first kind of, you know, critical mass level uh, maybe five, 500 uh, or more residents in phase one. And then adding in phase two, expanding the residential, hotel, entertainment elements, and perhaps uh, a tech uh, research uh, center. It's obvious uh, that we may uh, see such a project uh, funded by some partnerships from the technology sector. And, uh, and then, you know, um, the final phase would be uh, uh, finishing the megastructure and uh, housing a, a, a much larger uh, community. So um, these are some notions for such a project. Um, I'm just going to go through a few more frames here, just looking at kind of some different visions and ideas. Uh, obviously, it's uh, the whole process of finding a site and, and developing the, the overall concept um, would, you know, be a gradual collaborative design process. So, so having a, a, a visual concept for this, uh, uh, right now all we can do is just look at references. Um, uh, we can't get too specific on ideas until we go through uh, such a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, but here's some, some different kind of concepts. That, that was the first one was a Solari drawing. This is uh, the Jerdy partnership. And uh, I didn't mention earlier, I meant to say that uh, when I was in San Diego, I uh, <clears throat> experienced um, Horton Plaza. I don't know how many of you might have seen Horton Plaza before in San Diego. But at the time, it was a groundbreaking uh, shopping center in downtown San Francisco that, I mean, in downtown San Diego that brought uh, uh, a, a new life uh, to the downtown area. And it was a very three-dimensional architecture and I was uh, very delighted with it because I thought, this is, looks like Paolo's thinking. And uh, <clears throat> so a few years later, I was at the TED2 conference, standing in line waiting to try a virtual reality demo. And the guy standing in line in front of me and I'd heard of him, because I, I looked into Horton Plaza, was John Jarity. And uh, I said, John, I live in San Diego, and I, uh, I really think Horton Plaza is an amazing, uh, inspiring project. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been working with Paolo Soleri. He goes, oh, well, I was totally inspired by Paolo. I, I went to school out in Arizona. I, was, I slept under his drawing table at one point. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, and that led to, in later years, uh, not only Jerry's participation in the Paradox conferences, but we actually got together with them. And now these are guys, uh, and it's worth looking at their, their website as well, uh, jerry.com. Um, they've put together huge mixed-use infill developments all over the world and, uh, and you know, multi-stakeholder big projects. So they, they knew how to build things, make things happen. And so, uh, for a couple of years, they worked closely with us at the Kosani Foundation to create a new plan to develop our Kosani. And they included uh, a whole plan for a adjacent whole structural area that was a health and wellness center. Um, and it was a really pretty, pretty cool concept. I'm sorry it didn't 
ever go through all the way. Jared uh, did pass away a few years ago, but um, but that was a very vital relationship, and and his work remains uh, uh, inspirational as kind of a bridge from admittedly glorified shopping centers. I mean, they're mixed use of residential, commercial, entertainment, shopping kind of spaces, uh, but they uh, they opened up a lot of uh, uh, new doors uh, in that world. It's known as experience architecture, they call it. So here's some early arcology designs. Arcologies are designed containing, you know, a number of common design ideas and, uh, and you know, uh, different uh, uh, primary principles, but the design of an arcology is uh, very much a product of its location and the needs of the community, so they're all different. So this is a little more right-brained few slides here. This is a image of Soleri's most recent uh, work, The Lean Linear City. And uh, this is meant to be built over time in modules, the individual modules housing 1,500 people. Surrounded by natural land, transportation, power, water, sewage, all running along the arterial city. So back to Arco Santi, which remains our, our inspiration. That's the current model for the finished Arco Santi. You can see the small gray buildings, Old Town, the current Arco Santi, down in the lower part. And here's Arco Santi today. That's Jeff Stein, who was the president of the Cosani Foundation for many years. He was the dean of the Boston College School of Architecture. The use of curves and round windows instead of linear, unbelievable difference in just the feeling. <clears throat> nice to have a pool out there in the desert. The ceramics apps. This was at the uh, Convergence Conference a few months ago. Tycho drummers at night in the vault. This is David and Nadia and their son, and they're two longtime residents of Arcosani. They had their son there, was born there. This is one of the bedrooms in there. So that's one of the first arcologens. Yes, that's right. A new subspecies of humanity. Right. <laughs> and that's uh, David uh, talking with Zach Cervello, who is one of the uh, head honchos at the, the Burning Man Fly Ranch. Burning Man has purchased a huge property and is looking at various options for the development of that permanent community. I had the pleasure of staying in what originally was Paolo's apartment at Arcosani, and uh, so uh, we were hanging out there a little bit, and there's Katrina, who's here tonight. So, you know, you're looking out the window. Now, if you were in one of the larger apses that you see in the Arcosani models, you might have that same view, only from higher up, 20 stories up. This is Paolo's original drawing table in his studio there. A lot of creativity came out of that little room there. So that's the end of my formal discussion. And uh, it'd be great to have a little, how much time do we have? 
Take well, we're right minutes. at one o'clock. Yeah, we're right at nine o'clock. Take a few minutes for Q and A, and uh, so everyone, feel free to uh, ask questions. If you want your question to be recorded, uh, please grab the mic. Otherwise, uh, Michael, you may want to, you know, reiterate the question sure. before you answer it. Okay. But can we get the question. lights up a little? Who has the lights? Uh, Maybe in the way back. Yes. I have a question. Yes. My question is about, you haven't spoken anything about transportation. So, that's a very good question. In a city like this, where is your job going to be? And how are you going to get to it? A lot of walking. <laughs> and uh, a lot of escalators and moving walkways where necessary. The microphone. Yeah. A lot of walking, a lot of moving uh, walkways and escalators and things like that in, in an arcology. Uh, it's all, things are meant to become in proximity, but certainly uh, I, I kind of left out that subject, but in our discussions about building, I mean, we really looked, we were looking at farms outside of Davis, California. I mean, we had a lot of conversations. I was over in Alameda looking at the whole military base there. I had a meeting with Jerry Brown's people in Oakland. I mean, we really did pursue this idea in the early 2000s. And uh, some of our main connections were with uh, alternative tra transportation initiatives that were going on, which was one of the, the ideas that it would be coupled with. Uh, well, I'm talking about transportation to get to the project. But certainly within a large uh, archaeological uh, complex, there would be different forms of, of transportation but uh, you know I didn't mention this earlier but I grew up in Leewood Kansas a suburb of Kansas City Missouri and it was the Johnson County area back there is a sprawling upper middle class suburban area that was designed by JC Nichols and was actually the model one of the first model suburbs in the country and it was replicated all over the country and worldwide so I actually grew up in in one of the the places that started the suburban model. And so, you know, I go out to college at Arizona State and find out that uh, that's the, you know, the, the, the fall of civilization basically is uh, a culture that uh, encourages single family homes and the devastation of the landscape and designing whole cities uh, around cars, you know. so. Simply put, an arcology is a city without cars, you know? <laughs> but where are you going to work? Well, you, you, work, you, you work wherever you choose to. Like right now, where do I work? I work at home. I go out to meetings. I mean, the lifestyles are changing. And plus, you know, here's another thing. Yes, robots are coming. Yes, collect, uh, artificial intelligence is coming. Yes, we're going to be put out of a lot of these these standard kinds of jobs and professions. Well, what do we do with ourselves? Well, what happened to the, the Greek ideal? What happened to a society of people who are evolving themselves and educating themselves? Uh, you know, uh, we don't have to do work in the same old way. So anyway, I'm just kind of going off on a tangent there. But uh, uh, if you live in a, a short-term future arcology, then you're going to be close to other metropolitan areas. And yes, you may well have a job at a tech firm in Silicon Valley if you live at Calafia up north and you'll go there however you can if you have to drive, whatever, you know. But the ideal arcology concept is that of a city without cars, so. I, that's what I get, but then, you know, how do you pay the rent? Unless you work within the, will there be enough people that Ideally, yeah. Yes, sir. My question is, I think the way somebody said he was talking before. No, they're they're getting rowdy. And then remember to repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Of 
of Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, perhaps? <laughs> well, yeah, you're asking about, you know, the rising oceans, and I, I, you know, it was very dismaying to me over these decades to see how mainstream society basically ignored the, these concepts. Uh, but now I see that I guess this transmission of Soleri and, and others is all about how we're going to house the displaced millions, you know? I mean, it's happening. The seas are going to rise, and we're going to have coastal communities wiped out. And uh, according to some of our presentations at these Sierra Club dinners, it could be happening way faster than we think. Ten years, you know. Yeah. Well, there's all kinds of, you know. Soleri did original island arcologies, uh, were some of his first uh, design concepts, and also uh, a dam arcology. Okay, if you have to build a dam, why not thicken it and make it a city? A city that generates its own power, that waters its own farms. You know, those are some very compelling design ideas. Okay, let's get a few more questions in. Yes, ma'am. That's Dom and Her. Yeah, Dom and Her is a modern mystery school, and that means uh, that they actually did uh, incorporate the uh, teachings and even artifacts of a number of Egyptian and other European-based mystery schools. So they're very esoteric. Way in back, yes, sir. Yeah, and the, the, yeah, the sentries can also see down all the streets and see what everybody's yeah. doing and the whole grid concept. Absolutely, Mark's work is wonderful. Placemaking uh, movement. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, absolutely, that's actually very vital uh, because in a way it's the most important thing that we retrofit we build new systems and retrofit the existing infrastructures of our current cities to green them and there's all kinds of solutions emerging more all the time uh, for vertical gardens and uh, you know uh, windows that have solar cells built into them and things like this uh, not to mention the kinds of uh, smart city uh, concepts and um, new kinds of uh, HVAC uh, systems, and there's a lot to be done uh, to, to green uh, our current cities on a much grander scale than has been currently going on. There's basically a lot of infill projects that have, just like the eco-villages, have different ideas and concepts that they brought through uh, in the commercial development world. These infill projects uh, have pioneered all kinds of ideas, but now they need to be scaled up and replicated worldwide. You know, right here locally, uh, Arab Corporation uh, is a global engineering firm. They're huge, you know, they build ports, you know, they, they build infill projects. Uh, I've had them, they, they spoke at our World Environment Day event and uh, have been involved with some other people. And they, they would love to do projects like this. They are itching to do full-on eco-city projects, but meanwhile, Luckily, uh, they're involved in a lot of the really pioneering green infill projects. Uh, I think also uh, the uh, ideas surrounding arcology and eco-villages uh, can be brought into uh, our mainstream cities and towns. And there's wonderful initiatives such as uh, Jonathan Ute's uh, Place for Sustainable Living. If you don't know about that, Jonathan's here. He can maybe, during the discussion, tell us more about it. In Oakland, uh, they're, uh, they're doing a great job with that. Okay, yes. Um, thank you, Michael. It was really inspiring. And um, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, how these arcologies um, will actually 
actually um, integrate um, nature into them um, rather than cities right now, birds, migrating birds, other animals are come into the cities and are actually under threat by cars, by human habitation. So do those arcologies take into consideration? So how do arcologies uh, integrate the natural environment and and the interplay of birds and other species and so forth. Well, the basic notion is that um, you build a, uh, a megastructure, if you will, I know that sounds terrible, but a well-designed, aesthetically pleasing megastructure that includes uh, on multiple stories all kinds of foliage and, and gardens and vertical farms and things built in, greenhouses and so forth. But at the same time, it's also surrounded by natural land. Instead of bulldozing over everything and making streets and highways and little houses, keep the land natural, have farms and gardens. And so it's, that's, it's inherent to the concept that, that the natural and built environment are, are intersecting. Okay, a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think we would look at some of our advanced uh, uh, porta potties we have out at the festivals that are uh, using uh, systems to uh, to deal with human waste. I would cite a book that we have with Synergetic Press. And by the way, if you any of you want, you know, SynergeticPress.com. Uh, the code word is friends for twenty percent off any of our books. Okay. SynergeticPress.com, friends. And one of the books is called The Wastewater Gardener, built, uh, written by Mark Nelson, who is one of the Biospherians. And that's all about how we turn human waste into fertilizer, basically. Yes, sir. What needs to change so we can really see projects like this emerge? Well, you know, I did discuss the, the challenges, the zoning and so forth. I would like to think that um, we're going to see some forward-thinking leaders show up in the realms of commercial development and states and local governments and major NGOs, United Nations, who are going to be willing, more willing than in the past, to change the rules and do some dramatic projects. That's all I can say. And by the way, I have no formal affiliation. Uh, I'm, I'm just really kind of an educator networker in this space, but I am hoping that uh, kind of bringing this subject up again, uh, thanks again to Jamin for encouraging me to uh, uh, bring this information out. Uh, maybe we can get something sparked. It certainly is a much more um, poignant moment now than it was 10 or 12 years ago. One last question in the back. Yeah. The younger generations are obviously actualizing these concepts a lot more. Yes. I'm curious about your comments about intergenerational transfer of wealth, because there's plenty of projects who are like ready to launch, and so many of the people, particularly members of this type of club, are sitting on millions of dollars unable to actually directly donate them to projects. So how do you see intergenerational transfer of wealth and those who capitalize on a 20th century economy actually donating it to the next generation who's building these projects? Intergenerational transfer of wealth and how do we get things moving? Well, that's a very complex question. Uh, but I will say that uh, I ha hold out a lot of hope for uh, our younger uh, members of the regenerative culture movement. And, you know, we have organizations uh, around um, uh, that are, you know, really encouraging uh, uh, dialogue and um, 
new ways of uh, new models for philanthropy. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think it's it's basically uh, it's it's about a spark to get things going, and and, and a, a couple of I mean, I'd like to see Calafia and maybe two other sister projects around the world evolve together. You know, it's got to be a network of projects, really. But I do think that one or two exciting projects could uh, ignite a whole whole movement. And I think there's a lot of wealth that's sitting out there, uh, people who have such wealth wanting to do something, but they don't really know where the, the, the real leverage could be, you know? So, how are we doing, Jamin? Do we, do we